Jai, Hare Krishna, it's time to hear about His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami Prabhupada, founder of Maria, of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And this is six volumes of the biography, Srila Prabhupada Milamrita, by his disciple Satsvarup Das Goswami. And we are in New York. And Prabhupada has a following, a small following now. Some of the young people, the hippie types, bohemian types in New York, Lower East Side, they're taking care of him, making sure he has some facility, he has a little storefront uh, for preaching and an apartment upstairs, small. And now they have spontaneously decorated the little storefront. They took the curtains from their place and washed them and cleaned them and dyed them purple. And they built a platform for Prabhupada to sit on. And whatever they had, some of them had already been to India because they were looking, they were seekers. They'd been to India and they'd come back with paintings and prints and photos somehow related to Krishna. This was before they met Prabhupada, they just were attracted. And so they've decorated the, the little storefront. And Prabhupada's very pleased. Krishna. So this is chapter eight, planting the seed. I think this is when Prabhupada actually starts to get them to commit to chanting Hare Krishna a certain number of rounds and to accept initiation and become actually become disciples, not just followers, but actually disciples. So chapter eight, planting the seed. So there's a little paragraph here from a dialogue with Hayagriva. He wasn't Hayagriva yet, he was powered was one of the early ones that came. So this is what he says. Does what you told us this morning, Howard asked, mean we're supposed to accept spiritual master to be God? That means he is due the same respect as God, being God's representative, Prabhupada replied calmly. Then he's not God? No, no, Prabhupada said. God is God. The spiritual master is his representative. Therefore, he's as good as God because he can deliver God to the sincere disciple. Is that clear? August 1966. It was makeshift. A storefront turned temple and a two-room apartment transformed into Guru's residence and study. But it was complete, nonetheless. It was a complete monastery amid the city slums. The temple, the storefront, was quickly becoming known among the hip underground of the Lower East Side. The courtyard was a strangely peaceful place for aspiring monks, with its little garden, bird sanctuary, and trees squeezed in between the front and rear buildings. The Swami's back room was the inner sanctum of the monastery. Each room had a flavor all its own, or rather, it took on its particular character from the Swami's activities there. And if I'm not mistaken, there's a picture of that little courtyard with the bird bath. I don't know if it's here. I've seen it. I know it exists. I don't know if it's in the book or not. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Okay, there's a picture. You don't see the whole courtyard, but here's Prabhupada. This is in that little courtyard, is what it looks like. You can get the bird bath, the bird house, and that's the back wall is one of the walls of the building. So the little courtyard is in the middle of these buildings that surround it. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Lost my place, but it should be easy to find because it's right at the beginning of the chapter. Okay. Uh, Krishna. The temple room was his kirtan and lecture hall. The lecture was always serious and formal. Even from the beginning, when there was no dais, and he had to sit on a straw mat facing a few guests, it was clear he was here to instruct, not to invite casual give-and-take dialogue. Questions had to wait until, the finish, until he finished speaking. The audience would sit on the floor and listen for 45 minutes as he delivered Vedic knowledge intact, always speaking on the basis of Vedic authority. Quoting Sanskrit, quoting the previous spiritual masters, delivering perfect knowledge supported with reason and argument. While contending with noises of the street, he lectured with exacting scholarship and deeply committed devotion. It appeared that he had long ago mastered all the references and conclusions of his predecessors and had even come to anticipate all intellectual challenges. He also held kirtans in the storefront. He also held kirtans in the storefront. Like the lectures, the kirtans were serious, but they were not so formal. Prabhupada was lenient during kirtan. Visitors would bring harmoniums, wooden flutes, guitars. They would follow the melody or create their own improvisations. Someone brought an old string bass and bow. That's like a big, like a, you know, you've seen a cello? Well, it's a little bit bigger than a cello. It's like a big violin that stands upright. And an inspired guest could always pick up the bow and play along. Some of the boys had found the innards of an upright piano waiting on the curb with someone's garbage and had brought it to the temple and placed it near the entrance. During a kirtan, freewheeling guests would run their hands over the wires, creating strange vibrations. Robert Nelson, several weeks back, had brought a large symbol that now hung from the ceiling, dangling close by the Swami's dais. M many of these people were musicians, so these are unusual instruments, but many of them were musicians. There was a limit to the extravagance. Sometimes, when a newcomer picked up the cartels and played them in a beat other than the standard one, two, three, Swamiji would ask one of the boys to correct him even at the risk of offending the guest. Prabhupada led the chanting and drummed with one hand on a small bongo. Even on this little bongo drum, he played Bengali Madanga rhythms, so interesting that a local conga drummer used to come just to hear, quote, the Swami gets in some good licks, end quote. The Swami's kirtans were a new high and the boys would glance at each other with widening eyes and shaking heads as they responded to his chanting, comparing it to their previous drug experiences and signaling each other favorably. This is great. This is better than LSD. Hey man, I'm really getting high on this. And Prabhupada encouraged their newfound intoxication. As maestro of these kirtans, he was also acting expertly as guru. Lord Chaitanya had said, there is no hard and fast rules for chanting the holy name. And Prabhupada brought the chanting to the lower east side 
just that way. A kindergarten of spiritual life, he once called the temple. Here he taught the ABCs of Krishna consciousness, lecturing from Bhagavad Gita and leading the group chanting of Hare Krishna. Sometimes after the final kirtan, he would invite those who were interested to join him for further talks in his apartment. In the back room of his apartment, Prabhupada was usually alone, especially in the early morning hours, 2, 3, and 4 a.m., when almost no one else was awake. In these early hours, his room was silent, and he worked alone in the intimacy of his relationship with Krishna. He would sit on the floor behind his suitcase, worshiping Krishna by typing in translations and purports of his Srimad Bhagavatam. But this same back room was also used for meetings, and anyone who brought himself to knock on the Swami's door could enter and speak with him at any time, face to face. Prabhupada would sit back from his typewriter and give his time to talking, listening, answering questions, sometimes arguing or joking. A visitor might sit alone with him for half an hour before someone else would knock, and Swamiji would invite the newcomer to join them. New guests would come and others would go, but Swamiji stayed and sat and talked. Generally, visits were formal. His guests would ask philosophical questions and he would answer much the same way as after a lecture in the storefront. But occasionally, some of the boys, hang on, but occasionally, some of the boys who were becoming serious followers would monopolize his time, especially on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday nights when there was no evening lecture in the temple. Often they would ask him personal questions. What was it like when he first came to New York? What about India? Did he have followers there? Were his family members, devotees of Krishna? What was his spiritual master like? And then Prabhupada would talk in a different way, quieter, more intimate, and humorous. He told how one morning in New York, he had first seen snow and thought someone had whitewashed the buildings. He told how he had spoken at several churches in Butler, Pennsylvania. When the boys asked what kind of churches they were, he smiled and replied, I don't know. And they laughed with him. He would reminisce freely about the British control of India and about Indian politics. He told them it was not so much Gandhi as Subhash Chandra Bose who had liberated India. Subhas Chandra Bose had gone outside of India and started the Indian National Army. He entered into an agreement with Hitler that Indian soldiers fighting for British India who surrendered to the Germans could be returned to the Indian National Army to fight against the British. And it was this show of force by Bose, more than Gandhi's nonviolence, which led to India's independence. He talked of his childhood at the turn of the century when street lamps were gaslit and carriages and horse-drawn trams were all the only vehicles on Calcutta's dusty streets. These talks charmed the boys even more than the transcendental philosophy of Bhagavad Gita and drew them affectionately to him. He told about his father, Gormohan Day, a pure Vaishnava. His father had been a cloth merchant, and his family had been intimately related with the aristocratic Mullocks of Calcutta. <clears throat> the Mullocks had a deity of Krishna, and Prabhupada's father had given him a deity to worship as a child. He used to imitate the worship of the Govanda deity in the Mullocks temple. As a boy, he held his own Ratiyatra festivals each year, imitating in miniature the gigantic festival of Jagannath Puri, and his father's friends used to joke, oh, the Ratiyatra ceremony is going on at your home, and you do not invite us? What is this? His father would reply, this is a child's play, that's all. But the neighbors said, oh, child's play, you're avoiding us by saying it's for children.
Prabhupada finally remembered his father, who had never wanted him to be a worldly man, who had given him lessons in Radanga, and who had prayed to visiting sadhus that one day the boy would grow up to be a devotee of Radharani. One night he told how he had met his spiritual master. He told how he had begun his own chemical business but had left home and in 1959 had taken sannyas. The boys were interested, but so ignorant of the things Prabhupada was talking about that at the mention of a word like Murdanga or sannyas, they would have to ask what it meant. And he would go on conversational tangents, describing Indian spices, Indian drums, even Indian women. And whatever he spoke about, he would eventually shine upon it the light of the Shastra. He did not ration out such talks, but gave it out abundantly by the hour, day after day, as long as there was a real, live inquirer. <clears throat> At noon, the storefront became a dining hall, and in the evenings, a place of intimate worship. Prabhupada had kept the room with its 12-foot square hardwood parquet floor, clean and bare, the solitary coffee table against the wall between the two courtyard windows was the only furniture. Daily at noon, a dozen men were now taking lunch here with him. The meal was cooked by Keith, who spent the whole morning in the kitchen. At first, Keith had cooked only for the Swami. He had mastered the art of cooking dal, rice, and sabji in the Swami's three-tiered boiler, and usually there had been enough for one or two guests as well. But soon, more guests had begun to gather, and Prabhupada had told Keith to increase the quantity, abandoning the small three-tiered cooker, until he was cooking for a dozen hungry men. The boarders, Raphael and Don, though not so interested in Swami's talk, would arrive punctually each day for prasadam, usually with a friend or two who had wandered into the storefront. Steve would drop by from his job at the welfare office. The Mott Street group would come, and there were others. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. The phone in the other room. It's just spam, spam, spam call. Oh, boy. Goodbye. Hello, goodbye. Hare Krishna. I'm going to figure out what to do about that. The kitchen was stocked with standard Indian spices. Fresh chilies, fresh ginger root, whole cumin seeds, turmeric, aspartita. Keith, that's Kiran Ananda, mastered the basic cooking techniques and passed them on to Chuck. I'm not sure who Chuck is. Who became his assistant. Some of the other boys would stand at the doorway. Is that a Chudananda? It might be a Chudananda, Chuck. Some of the other boys would stand at the doorway of the narrow kitchenette to watch Keith as one thick pancake-like chapati after another blew up like an inflated football over the open flame and then took its place in the steaming stack. While the fine basmati rice boiled to a moist, fluffy white finish, and the sabji simmered, the noon cooking would climax with the chants. Keith prepared the chants exactly as Swami had shown him. Over the flame, he set a small metal cup half filled with clarified butter, then put in cumin seeds. When the seeds turned almost black, he added chilies, and as the chilies blackened, a choking smoke began to pour from the cup. Now the chants was ready. With his Cook's tongs, Keith lifted the cup, its boiling, crackling mixture fuming like a sorcerer's kettle, and brought it to the edge of the pot of boiling dal. He opened the tight cover slightly, dumped the boiling chants into the dal with a flick of his wrist, and immediately replaced the lid. Pow! The meeting of the chants and dal created an explosion, which was then greeted by cheers from the doorway signifying that the cooking was now complete. 
His final operation was so volatile that it once blew the top of the pot to the ceiling with a loud smash, causing minor burns to Keith's hand. Some of the neighbors complained of acrid, penetrating fumes, but the devotees loved it. When lunch was ready, Swamiji would wash his hands and mouth in the bathroom and come out into the front room, his soft pink-bottomed feet always bare, his saffron dhoti reaching down to his ankles. He would stand by the coffee table, which held the picture of Lord Chaitanya and his associates, while his own associates stood around him against the walls. Keith would bring in a big tray of chapati stacked by the dozen and place it on the floor before the altar table, along with pots of rice, dal, sabji. Swamiji would then recite the Bengali prayer for offering food to the Lord, and all present would follow him by bowing down, knees and head to the floor, and approximating the Bengali prayer one word at a time. While the steam and mixed aromas drifted up like an offering of incense before the picture of Lord Chaitanya, the Swami's followers bowed their heads to the wooden floor and mumbled the prayers. Prabhupada then sat with his friends, eating the same prasadam as they, with the addition of a banana and a metal bowl full of hot milk. He would slice the banana by pushing it downward against the edge of the bowl, letting the slices fall into the hot milk. Prabhupada's open decree that everyone should eat as much prasadam as possible created a humorous mood and a family feeling. No one was allowed simply to sit, picking at his food, nibbling politely. They ate with gusto. Prabhupada almost insisted upon it. If he saw someone not eating heartily, he would call the person's name and smilingly protest, Why are you not eating? Take prasadam. And he would laugh. When I was coming to your country on the boat, he said, I thought, how will the Americans ever eat this food? And as the boys pushed their plates forward for more, Keith would serve seconds, more rice, dal, chapatis, and sabji. After all, it was spiritual. You were supposed to eat a lot. It would purify you. It would free you from maya. Besides, it was good, delicious, and spicy. This was better than American food. It was like chanting. It was far up. You got high from eating this food. They ate with the right hand, Indian style. Keith and Howard had already learned this and had even tasted similar dishes, but as they told the Swami and a room full of believers, the food in India had never been this good. One boy, Stanley, was quite young. The Prabhupada almost like a doting father, watched over him as he ate. Stanley's mother had personally met Prabhupada and said that only if he took personal care of her son would she allow him to live in the monastery. Prabhupada complied. He diligently encouraged the boy until Stanley gradually took on a voracious appetite and began consuming ten chapatis at a sitting, and he would have taken more had Swami not told him to stop. But aside from Swamiji's limiting Stanley to ten chapatis, the word was always, more, take more. When Prabhupada was finished, he would rise and leave the room. Keith would catch a couple of volunteers to help him clean, and the others would leave. Occasionally, on a Sunday, Prabhupada himself would cook a feast with special Indian dishes. Steve says, Swamiji personally cooked the prasadam, and then served it to us upstairs in his front room. We all sat in rows, and I remember him walking up and down in between the rows of boys, passing before us with his bare feet and serving us with a spoon from different pots. He would ask what we, what did we want? Did we want more of this? He would serve us with pleasure. These dishes were not ordinary, but sweets and savories, like sweet rice and kachoris with special tastes. Even after we had all taken a full plate, he would come back and ask us to take more. Once he came to me and asked what I would like more of, would I like more sweet rice? In my early misconceptions of spiritual life, I thought I should deny myself what I liked best. So I asked for some more plain rice. But even that plain rice was fancy yellow rice with fried cheese balls. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, one more little section here. On off nights, his apartment was quiet. He might remain alone for the whole evening, typing and translating Srimad Bhagavatam, or talking in a relaxed atmosphere to just one or two guests until 10. But on meeting nights, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, there was activity in every room of his apartment. He wasn't alone anymore. His new followers were helping him, and they shared in his spirit of trying to get people to chant Hare Krishna and hear of Krishna consciousness. In the back room, he worked on his translation of the Bhagavatam, or spoke with guests up until six, when he would go to take his bath. Sometimes he would have to wait until the bathroom was free. He had introduced his young followers to the practice of taking two baths a day, and now he was sometimes inconvenienced by having to share his bathroom. After his bath, he would come into the front room where his assembled followers would sit around him. He would sit on a mat facing his picture of the Panchatattva, and after putting a few drops of water in his left palm from a small metal spoon and bowl, he would rub a lump of Vrindavan clay in the water, making a wet paste. He would then apply the clay markings of Vaishnav Tilak, dipping into the yellowish paste in his left hand with the ring finger of his right hand. He would scrape wet clay from his palm, and while looking into a small mirror, which he held deftly between the thumb and pinky of his left hand, he would mark a vertical clay strip up his forehead and then trim the clay into two parallel lines by placing the little finger of his right hand between his eyebrows and running it upward past the hairline, clearing a path in the still moist clay. Then he marked 11 other places on his body while the boys sat observing, sometimes asking questions, sometimes speaking their own understandings of Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada says, my Guru Maharaj used to put tilak without a mirror. Devotee asked, did it come out neat? Prabhupada, neat or not neat, that does not matter, but yes, it was neat. Prabhupada then would silently recite Gayatri Mantra, holding his Brahmin's sacred thread and looping it around his right thumb. He would sit erect, silently moving his lips. His bare shoulders and arms were quite thin, as was his chest but he had a round, slightly protruding belly. His complexion was as satiny smooth as a young boy's, except for his face, which bore signs of age. The movements of his hands were metho methodical, aristocratic, and yet delicate. He picked up two brass bells in his left hand and began ringing them. Then, lighting two sticks of incense from the candle, near the picture of Lord Chaitanya and his associates, he began waving the incense slowly in small circles before Lord Chaitanya while still ringing the bells. He looked deeply at the picture and continued, continued cutting spirals of fragments, fragrant smoke, all the while ringing the bells. None of the boys knew what was going on, although he did it every evening, but it was a ceremony that meant something the boys began to call the ceremony bells. After bells, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, it would usually be time for the evening kirtan. Some of the boys would already be downstairs greeting guests, explaining about the Swami and the chanting. But without the Swami, nothing could begin. No one knew how to sing or drum, and no one dared think of leading the mantra chanting without him. Only when he entered at seven o'clock could they begin. Freshly showered and dressed in his clean Indian hand-woven cloth, his arms and body decorated with the arrow-like Vaishnav markings, Prabhupada would leave his apartment, go downstairs to face another ecstatic opportunity to glorify Krishna. The tiny temple would be crowded with wild, unremitical, candid, young Americans. Hare Krishna.
Jai. Jai Srila Prabhupada. Jai Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama.